Hello, everyone. We and welcome. Thank you all for joining us uh, for today's webinar. Uh, we are recording. Uh, just a few reminders for anyone who might be new to webinar, and that is to look at the bar of um, icons and notice the chat icon, which is where you can type in any comments or questions during Perry's presentation. I will be monitoring questions and comments, and about 15 minutes before three, we will stop and have a chance to cover your questions. So today's webinar is Reinventing Global Leadership in Pursuit of a Remarkable Culture. Our speaker is Perry Holly, and thank you, Perry, for being with us. Perry is Vice President at Cultural Solutions at Berlitz. He's a global leadership consultant and published author. And I will now give the floor Perry himself. Terrific. Good afternoon. Thank you, Linda. Thank you very much. It's great to be with you. I was uh, preparing for a, a talk I was going to give recently, and I ran across a, a, a story that said that um, that the, the most um, longest standing international um, Sporting trophy, you know, the international sporting trophy, the oldest international sporting trophy. I thought my mind raced, what could it be? Is it golf? Is it some Olympic sport of some sort? Uh, it turned out to be America's Cup yacht racing. I was stunned. I guess they started in 1851. Um, and I was interested to learn, I think, as uh, an American, I thought it was an American thing. It's not. It's an international the way they got the name was the, the first yacht to win in 1851 was called the America. And the uh, pursuit in following years was to win back the cup from America. So it became America's cup. But all that aside, what interested me was uh, they said that in 1851, the top speed of one of the yachts was uh, 11 knots. I don't know if that's good or bad, but it's, uh, it's 11 knots. What really got my attention was says that after 156 years of yacht racing, they were able to increase the speed of, of the yachts, and they don't look like yachts anymore to me, but they were able to increase it by four knots. That seemed like a, a very small gain over such a large um, time span, 156 years. But then it really piqued my interest. It said in just 10 short years, uh, moving up to 2017 was when the last America's Cup race was held, that the top speed then has now moved up to 50 knots. And you think, wow, in uh, 156 years, a four knot gain, but in just 10 years, they've almost they more than tripled the speed of these boats. And if I ask you, why do you think that is? What happened? Uh, you can probably tell from the picture that um, technology has changed, but what really uh, transpired and why I love this story is that um, in, 20, in 2007, they had a rule change and they, they allowed boats to begin to use different types of technology that they had never allowed before. And this rule change is uh, very interesting to me because I think when, on our topic today, thinking about uh, global leadership and cross-cultural leadership and what's going on in uh, the world today, that to me it's become uh, the, the rules have changed over the last uh, uh, dozen years or so. And that the, uh, if, if we're not aware of it and you're trying to lead uh, today in the markets that we serve, that you need to be aware that these, this perfect storm of global conditions, I feel, have really led to leaders really needing to take a step up, that we've really got to think about uh, how do we develop a remarkable culture in our organizations that can drive across some of these challenges that uh, change and disruption are happening everywhere and they're, at, they're accelerating, I feel. 
um, multicultural aspects. Um, unbelievable, not only companies reaching across borders, they're expected to compete globally, but even on teams, if you're not inside your border, the, uh, the ability for people to move and go around the world has made every team I'm on and every team I lead a, a very cross-cultural, multicultural experience just inside my own organization. And I thought one thing was interesting to me was it's the first time in history we have five generations in the workplace all at the same time. And that causes, from a leadership point of view, that I've got a traditionalist from maybe pre-1955 uh, or so, 1960, uh, to baby boomers all the way to uh, millennials now, and looking for the next generation they are calling the 2020 um, generation. So lots of dynamics going on in the workplace. When I think of a remarkable culture as a leader, what am I trying to develop? It really has come down to you know, this ability to retain and really attract and retain top talent. Um, I really need to think about team success over personal success. And in the past, it used to be so much about you winning. Now it's about us winning. Um, I'm looking for teams. I want to develop teams that think like owners, not like I've just hired help. I, I need people with, uh, that can think and, and help me uh, as a leader. So I want to attract those types of people. Um, making sure that personal and corporate values are recognized and um, respected in the workplace. So the, the, the complex problem solvers that we need, um, personal authenticity. I, I, don't, I can't afford to be putting on a mask and trying to make you think I'm, I need to be able to be authentic. And I want my team of individuals on my team to be authentic, to be who they are, no matter where they're from, no matter what their backgrounds are. I need you to be you because that's the best you I'm ever going to get. And that this global mindset that um, just drives inclusiveness and, and this inclusiveness of people and inclusiveness of, of ideas. So for, for me, it's a big list to have, and remarkable is a, um, a strong word, but if I want to have a remarkable culture, these are the things that a leader needs to be thinking about. I'll boil it down for what I do and what, what I've seen uh, globally is really looking at um, three things that I think to today that I'm going to look for, I'm trying to drive through our short time we have together today, is that if, if I can, in my leadership ability, really increase my credibility, my reputation as a leader, that's a win. If I can increase my ability to influence people, then that's a win. And if I can increase my ability to fully engage my followers, my team, my family, um, that's a real, a real win for me. And I'm thinking for, um, for me, I want to just set the tone of, of where I'm coming from leadership wise is that leadership to me is about influence. And the reason, um, and what I really hope you take away from today is that leadership is not a title. It's not about you um, being able to tell people what to do. It, this is about influencing across borders, across backgrounds, across um, dynamics, across organizations. It doesn't matter if you have a title, you're, a, you're a, a manager of some sort, or if you're just an individual contributor, you need to be able to influence, positively influence others around you. And when I think of um, doing that, it's really a, a, a rule change in the marketplace today is that uh, it's no longer about uh, command and control. It's about influence and about um, driving people and working with people and collaborating with people to get things done and, and to move the ball forward. I mentioned uh, number three of my top three was driving employee engagement that if I'm going to be a successful leader in any environment, if I'm going to successfully influence others, then I need to be able to fully engage my team. I was interested by this um, survey that's been done over the years um, looking at all the employee engagement uh, surveys to say that on, on typical, if that were your team of 10 people were in your boat, that if we looked at the, the, the surveys and, and just you know, did a across the board, what does it look like? It's a little bit shocking to say that 
only three of the 10 would be rowing with you, actually have the oar and be rowing. Five would be sitting with the oar across their lap, uh, watching the scenery go by. And two, based on the surveys, would be actively trying to sink the boat. Now, when I share this in an audience situation, you hear a little bit of a, uh, a laugh or a chuckle go through the room until we all start thinking about, what about my boat? What about the boat I'm in, the boat I'm leading? Who are my rowers? Who are my watchers? Who are my sinkers? And when I really start thinking about that is, can I as a leader affect who's rowing, watching, and sinking? And we could go into a long discussion about, can you turn a sinker into a rower? Uh, can you coach and, and um, mentor and develop people? Um, there's lots of uh, yes and no back and forth on that topic. But what I want to look at is saying, if it were me in today's environment, really looking at what's going on with this perfect storm and my desire to develop leaders, my credibility as a leader, influence people, and fully engage people, what would I need to do as a 21st century global leader, what would I need to do? So I just thought, here's some questions that I would ask myself when I'm in that situation. Number one is always comes back to me. They say the hardest person to lead is yourself. And the question I put here is, number one question I have to ask myself as a 21st century global leader is, Am I leading myself well? Now you may think, what? What's that got to do with anything? Well, the rule changed. I said the rules have changed. Uh, used to be people joined companies uh, for life. They stayed a long time, long tenure at, uh, at one company. That was kind of from my generation and, and back. It's no longer that way. Um, uh, young people coming into the workplace today, even um, two generations, have no, no problem jumping companies and, and leaving. I find that people very rarely, if I ask you what was the number one reason why people quit a company, why they resign, and they don't really quit the company, they quit you, um, what is the number one reason? It often comes down to what they told us was money. But when you get down to it, the real answer after surveys, exit surveys, and what they say, it's about, I didn't feel valued, I didn't feel relevant, I, I didn't feel like you knew me at all. Um, I didn't feel like I added, you, you didn't need me, and I, I didn't feel valued. So today, um, people are looking to follow individuals that they want to follow. Not that they have to follow them, but they want to. So my saying is, is that people are watching you all the time. And the question you have to ask yourself is, what are they watching for? So if you're going to be a global leader in, in a cross-cultural team inside your border, or even uh, more importantly, outside the borders where you are, what do people see? What are they looking for? And I'll tell you, they're looking for your actions, your reactions to things, your levels of consistency, your authenticity. Do you do what you say? Do you walk the talk? And all that's about, about you and how you lead you. So are you doing the disciplines of leadership? And are you a great example for the people watching you so that they want to follow you they don't have to, they, they want to be in that. I'm thinking now I've got people that are rowing and not, not watching. Uh, another thing I have always said is that people um, buy into you before they buy into what you're doing, to what your vision is, to what you're trying to accomplish. If they're not bought into you, you're going to have a really hard time getting people to be rowing all the time. They're more likely to lay that oar across their lap, and watch the scenery go by because they're trying to figure out about you. So don't take this one lightly. I know a lot of times uh, people will say, yeah, yeah, that's all, that's all that soft stuff. It's, it's a people business. No matter what you're doing, it's about people. And they're watching to see how you lead you. I think I just told you all that, that people are watching you and people buy into you before they buy into what, to what you're doing. Question number two, uh, how can I influence, uh, how can I increase my effectiveness in a multicultural, global-reaching workplace. Now, the rule change here is that it was very clear that the, the workplace of 2020, this, I can't believe this, this around the corner, uh, is going to look nothing like the workplace 
of 2010. And so what's changed is really around this um, globally expanding, uh, culturally expanding workplace. You really need to understand, um, and this is new for most of the leaders I'm speaking to, is the, the various levels of culture that uh, are affecting how people think and how people behave. And we tend to think a lot about national culture. Um, you know, I'm an American, you're European, you're a German, you're, you're from France. Um, that's, that's kind of obvious um, and we, we know about that, but then there's so many other things going on underneath that. The um, ethnic and regional um, uh, cultures, the organizational culture where you are in, in the organization. And it really establishes um, how people act and how they behave. And I, I know that for me, um, Linda has you know, introduced me as a, a global leadership guy, but I've, I've been doing uh, global leadership for about 15 years. And I've spoken in 47 countries and I've had a tremendous amount of, of um, cultural uh, exposure. But I realized as I started studying this more, um, boy, I must have just been lucky. Um, sometimes I just kept my mouth shut and which really saved me because I did not understand all that was going on around me. And today, as a leader of a, of a multicultural team and a global company, I'm finding that it really is paying off for me to understand some of these dynamics that are going on. And it could be as simple as uh, I was in a, a restaurant in Italy, uh, in Rome, I believe, and I, we had been there probably 45 minutes, 50 minutes, an hour, maybe a little over an hour, having our meal it was delightful, everything was perfect. And all I did was ask the waiter, when you get a chance, could you bring me the check? And he, his shoulders dropped and he looked at me, he came over, he took his glasses off, he rubbed his eyes. He said, is something wrong? Was the meal not to your satisfaction? It, to be honest, it was one of the better meals I've ever had. It was a great restaurant, tremendous energy. It was fun. And I, I, I said, well, I, I don't know what you mean. He said, well, why do you want to leave? And it, as he said, let me bring you um, some grappa and some limoncellos on me. And he brought complimentary drinks because he thought I was having a bad time. And as I went back, I said, what happened? What just happened? I'm not having a bad time. But to an American, where a meal is something we, we, we actually use the term, let's just grab a bite. We, we, we're too fast. We, we move in and out of a meal. It's, it's not a meaningful experience. It's just something we have to do. In his culture, um, it was, it's, it's a, a bonding experience. It's a, it's a time to sit and enjoy friends. It's a, a, a culturally um, mixing it up and um, enjoying the moment. Uh, we're more about doing he was more about being. And to be honest, I really like his culture better at that. I like being able to sit and enjoy. But there's little things like that that have affected me over the years of going to different cultures, saying as a leader today, I better understand that we have this level of, of cultures and, and uh, dynamics going on that I need to be paying attention to. Which leads me to question three. Uh, am I aware of my own style and any bias that I may have when it comes to my ability to lead globally. This um, concept of um, bias and uh, the rule change, the rule change here for me was that this the multicultural cross-border, and I can't, we don't even have time to talk about matrix, dy dynamics of matrix leadership, where you have people maybe in different countries, different places, different uh, locations, um, that they really raised the bar for me to, for me as a leader. So the bias idea, and I, there's a lot being written today and, and talked about, about unconscious bias. And if you're not looked into that, uh, it's really very interesting. But just things that I'm not aware that I do based on my background, my cultural environment, my, my personal experiences are ways that I may um, unconsciously see others and it drives some of my behavior. One thing that's um, really clear in the cross-cultural leadership uh, area and looking at my team, either inside my border on a multicultural team or across borders, 
is that I need to be very careful, this danger zone, this bias danger zone of stereotyping. I mean, I've seen this um, in myself. I've actually, I think most of us probably have been a victim of it. Um, I gave a speech in, um, in Europe and um, I'd been to this company several times and somebody felt comfortable enough over a coffee telling me that you're not like most Americans. And I, I said, what, what's most Americans? What does that mean? And then I realized I, I do that sometimes too. I, I see somebody from a culture and I think everybody's got the same um, background stereotyping that. So I, I just say here as a leader uh, in the 21st century, um, actually in any century, we need to be doing whatever we can to learn about, uncover our bias. And, and some people I have told me, I don't, I don't have any bias. I'm, uh, everybody else has bias, not me. So they have a bias for you called the bias blind spot that your tendency to see yourself as less biased than others. So I thought you'd enjoy that. For me, I, uh, I had to kind of wake up to the fact that I was in a, um, a thought in me, the more you teach this, the more obvious it becomes in you. So I, it's, it's a great thing about teaching something is it uncovers things in you. Um, I was in a restaurant and uh, in New York City, and the waiter um, came to wait on my table, had uh, tattoos on every available um, visible part of his body. And I noticed in me immediately, uh, I, I did not want to be, um, it, it, I didn't want to be a part of it. I just thought, oh no, I don't want to talk to this guy. He asked for my drink order. And as he walked away, it hit me. What did I just do? Inside my head, I had an unconscious bias about something about a tattoo. Not just a tattoo, he had a lot of tattoos, but what is that about? So what do I do? I, I, when he came back, I just started asking questions, a little curious about his background. I just asked him a couple of questions, not, not a lot of time in that exchange, but over the course of the meal and his service, I realized this is somebody that I would actually like to hang out with, I would like to be friends with. We had some things in common. And it really woke me up to the fact that I think we all need to be aware of in our leadership and in our influencing others is how we see people and just calling it out to yourself. It's, it really is requires some uh, uh, reflection internally for us. So what if you're gonna do the, the, the tools that I use today, if I'm going to really look at how I'm um, my, my style and my bias or anything that's um, going on in me. At Berlitz, we, we use a, a cultural orientations model. And there are others out there that you can um, obviously apply to, but we look at the culture as the three dimensions of culture. You'll see there on the screen, interaction style, um, you know, how I communicate and engage, like my thinking style, how I process information, and then my sense of self, how I, how I view self, how I'm motivated to do that. And when I take the uh, um, cultural orientations index, the, the, the survey that we have, it tells me about me. And so you'll see on the screen under each of the uh, three dimensions, we have um, there's 17 uh, cultural in continua there that, that have these orientations. So 34 orientations on 17 um, scales there and telling me where do I fit on these three um, cultural dimensions. And it's very interesting when you, when you take the survey, so if I told, showed you, I'll just show you mine, it comes out and tells me what, uh, tells me about me. And it, it tells me things like um, my interaction style says that I'm, I really like to follow schedules and I manage time precisely. That is gonna show up in my restaurant experience in Italy. That's, not a, uh, that's gonna be a conflict there. How do I handle conflict? I do it directly. I like to give people feedback. I like to receive feedback directly. Um, I, I abide by rules. I'm, I'm a, kind, of a, um, kind of a strict kind of guy that way. And you got the thinking style and the sense of self. But it tells me about me when I put those on this chart to say, do you see the, the red circles there are how I um, come, come out in the, in the assessment? What, what would I do with that uh, is well, where am I going to be working? Who are the people on my team? What are their styles? How should we interact? Uh, what do I need to be aware of? 
make sure that I am influencing, engaging, and, and developing the people that I'm working with. And it's, um, for me, I, I, we're working with a uh, client. Uh, each of these, by the way, shows a degree of strength. And so some of them I'm stronger in, some of them I'm very strong in, some of them I'm in the middle. I'm working with a client that is in the, is a, a U.S. based restaurant company that wants to globally expand. Their, their first trial at expanding is to go from the United States to Canada. Now, my natural uh, thought process on that is, why would you want to worry about cultural dimensions if you're just going from U.S. to Canada? Aren't they, isn't Canada just like U.S. North? Isn't it like, aren't they like us? And this is what's so uh, impressive about uh, taking some uh, cultural leadership and some cultural education is that you, you would, a typical American might think that, but an educated uh, and culturally educated person would, would look deeper and say, no, what are, uh, how am I going to fare? How is this company going to fare when they go to Canada? What are the cultural norms that are different from what I think is a norm? And when I compared it to Canada, I'll just show you mine again, I, I was thinking maybe one or two gaps, uh, maybe between me and Canada, 10. I, I was blown away, 10 gaps for me. And it, it just really uh, put the message clear to me that no matter where you're going, no matter who you're working with, their background and their come from is, uh, has differences from you. And I need to take that seriously. If I'm gonna be a 21st century global leader, making impact on the business, influencing people, highly engaging the workforce and, and driving the vision of the company, I need to pay attention to this. So when I look at, you know, I circled for you there, some of the ones that were uh, strong and really strong for me, um, thinking, what, what does that, what do I do with that? So when I look further, I, I said, oh, I, first of all, I said, I wonder what Germany, because I do some work in Germany, it must be more than Canada. No, it was actually, I relate better, but still eight gaps. I then did an analysis of Japan and I was down to six gaps uh, for Japan. So Canada, our closest neighbor, was my largest gap. Uh, taught, me, taught me a lot. So what I did with that was um, looking at the, the style. I took one that where Canada is very strong as an indirect communication and handling conflict where I'm a very direct and it I kind of look at the obstacles and the answers for that so I won't drag you through my uh, my analysis of me but for for uh, purposes of leading in the 21st century and being effective uh, on your teams and across borders and across cultures knowing how you see things and how your cultural backgrounds are going to be affected going to other places even as similar as Canada to the US um, there are there are opportunities to to really uh, negatively affect your ability to to influence people if you don't pay attention to these things. So for me, it was a big eye opener to say, um, pay attention to this and really begin to look at how to be effective. I I'd say, so what do I do with that? Well, we call it style shifting. I saw this uh, great um, uh, TEDx talk, uh, Julia Middleton. Uh, she had a really neat way of looking at it that she presented. It's affected my thinking, so I just share it with you here. But there are certain things that are a part of my core, and certain things I can flex on, and I just need to know what those what those are. Um, she showed, um, you know, that different how you move the flex. Uh, I was she made a, a made me smile about how she said there's, you know, when you're younger everything's flex, and when you're older everything's core. You, you don't flex as much. Uh, I was watching the, I don't know if you followed the politics in the US, but it's uh, it's the one on the right there. It's, uh, it's all core, no flex, and we need to, we need to figure out how, how to flex. So I started thinking of applying it to me and some of the experiences I've had, you know, how I see time, I've already mentioned that, that I'm a very fixed person. Um, that's part of my core. Um, but some of the cultures I go to are very fluid. I gave a speech in Latin America, speech start time was 8.30. I came in at, you know, uh, 7.30 to get set up, 8 o'clock I'm ready, 8.30 there's no one in the room, 8.45 a couple of people um, uh, wander in, 
Uh, there's an audience of 500 supposed to be there. The room is enormous, but there's nobody there but me and a few people. Uh, toward nine o'clock, the crowd started showing up, and at 9:15, they introduced me. And I, for me, not to understand this dimension made me think that that's very unprofessional. But it wasn't unprofessional. It's only unprofessional to me in, in their culture. It was it was very normal, and they were very fluid on time. I'm very fixed. So that's something I can flex on. I don't need to uh, hold my high standard over somebody where that's not their standard. Uh, another example I had was uh, formal or informal. I'm a very formal person. I, I see things in a certain way, and I be careful about that. But a colleague invited me. Uh, we were in a, I forget what city we were in, invited me to go to a voodoo uh, demonstration. You know, I thought about that for a moment, and based on my um, upbringing and my core values where I am, that's not something I wanted to flex on. So I, I, I declined. That's part of my core, and I, I chose not to flex. The idea here is, am I just a, aware? Uh, the awareness of knowing who you are, knowing the norms and cultural dimensions of where you're visiting and where you're living or where you're doing business allows you to know how to define your core and your flex. So I thought uh, Ms. Middleton's um, metaphor there was fantastic. I love that a lot. Number four, uh, I think curiosity is the key uh, to a lot of what our struggles are when we lead teams with people from backgrounds different from ourselves in countries that are different from where we came from. And that the question I want to ask is, am I encouraging curiosity within myself and my team in my organization? And the rule change here is that uh, everybody you associate with, uh, partners, uh, team, customers, are more diverse than ever and have various cultural backgrounds. And if you're not uh, looking into um, with a curious eye about how you can learn, you're probably going to miss some opportunities. One thing I uh, have embraced in this area is can I ask more questions? And that good leaders, in my opinion, ask great questions. And that helps me, I think it helped me a lot in my, um, my, my international uh, speaking um, business to ask more questions and not, uh, as a, an American might just assume that I know how things work. I, I don't assume that. I just, I start asking questions and it opens doors. It helps me connect with the people that I'm working with and serving as a speaker or um, a facilitator. Uh, it actually opens up um, a door to some humility to help me some develop some humility, which is um, another interesting, uh, probably a, a very large skill for a 21st century leader is to um, put yourself, um, think of yourself a little less and think of others more. It helps me a lot. It helps me engage. If I ask questions, it helps me engage other people and it helps me go across these biases and boundaries that I may have in my own mind or uh, that may actually really exist, but it helps me to understand better. So, uh, questions are, are big. Uh, number five, um, am I developing my personal and my team's cultural intelligence? That The rule change here is that um, organizational culture that you have is affected by the various national and ethnic cultures that are represented there. And if, if you're thinking everybody's uh, just like you and um, the culture is the culture and it doesn't have any effect, you'll find that that is um, not true any longer got to be um, thinking about how you how you develop your your cultural skills to do that I didn't really understand this um, early in my career but I'm finding out now that part of this rule change the way teams are built is that um, your followers have a way that they want to be led that they're that they're used to being led that based on their culture, how they see hierarchy, how they see power, uh, how they, um, even in their family lives coming up, how their parents may have uh, led them or, or um, give them instructions, how they communicated, is a lot how they see that they want to see in their leader. And if you're not aware of that, then you set yourself up to be less effective because people will begin to, um, to, to turn away and, uh, and, kind of put the aura across your lap and not engage the way you want to. So I think for, for me, learning these skills, it's a, it requires a little bit every day because you're not going to be able to know everything, but could you know enough to understand where people are coming from to help 
develop your leadership effectiveness. And so some of the things that I want to learn are really about cultural systems. The uh, um, cultural systems may be things like, um, is there where they come from? Are they um, um, socialists or capitalists? You know, if you're coming to the United States, it might be helpful to know what is the capitalist structure for, um, for economic, what does that mean? Well, how do Americans think that way? When we're coming to countries, and most of the world, by the way, is socialist, so we really need to learn coming to other countries, what is the socialist mindset? What, are, what, are, what drives those behaviors in there? Uh, family structures, education systems, um, legal systems, religious systems. Um, what, are, what are these backgrounds and how do they affect me? The, what are their, their cultural values uh, that are there? I put language on there as well. I, I, I tell you on the systems piece, though, back on that, I, was, I put that picture of the cricket players because I was in uh, India and got invited by one of my colleagues. They knew I was there over the weekend and asked me if I'd like to go to a cricket match. Now, as an American, a cricket match is something that we, we don't understand. And we, uh, to be honest, I, I almost said no, but I didn't want to be stuck in the hotel, so I went. And it really became a, a great word picture for me of what my lack of knowledge about cricket, I, I kind of pushed it away. It's not something I, I would enjoy. But as my colleague began to explain what was happening and who was doing what, what the objective was, as I got more knowledge about the game, I got more involved and became more engaged in what was going on. I actually wondered uh, if I could do that. It, it, I began to see the skill involved and it opened my eyes to an, an entirely new game. Uh, just a few weeks ago, I was in Ireland and I saw a game of hurling. I almost made a joke about it, but then I remembered maybe I should learn about this. It turns out they've been playing it for 4,000 years and it's, uh, it's the national game. So I, I learned very quickly, keep my mouth shut, ask good questions and learn about other ways of doing things. The language differences, I just had to smile because the, uh, the very famous uh, in the US, very famous uh, ad campaign years ago on Got Milk was translated in uh, Latin America to are you lactating? So we wanna be careful about the language and we wanna be careful about um, whatever we can learn to make us more educated. My final question, and I'll begin to wrap this up, is uh, am I exhibiting an empathetic communication style? Uh, the rule change here is about um, these differences in our backgrounds and ethnicities mean that uh, I need, as a leader, I need to be leading the whole person, not just the corporate person. So if you work for the XYZ company, you are a manager or a leader, you think I need to lead the XYZ person. They're at work. But people come with their entire lives. They've got challenges and families and um, good things and bad things. And as a leader, this empathetic communication style really begins to um, open, the, open my eyes to the, to the whole person and what's going on. If I really want to increase my credibility as a leader, increase my ability to influence others, and increase my ability to engage, fully engage the whole team, this empathetic style is something I need to make sure that I'm embracing. Uh, surveys in 2017, I, I was reading and it said that the number one skill of a high engagement leader, uh, I got my pen out, my paper, I'm ready, uh, this is gonna be fantastic. Um, they said it's empathy. I went, what? I had to go back, I must have missed it. No, it seems so, so um, soft that it's not. It's again, it's people business and leading is about people. And you're, you're going to ask people and try and take them to a new level. You're going to need to understand where they're coming from. You're going to need, need to see their world and not be judgmental and um, understand that people have feelings and that you can communicate that you understand and that, that you will really be able to embrace people in a way that they will want to follow you. They don't have to, they want to. So wrapping up, I just, when I look at, um, the skills that I think are necessary, what I'm, what I'm finding in my own research and writing, uh, my travels and working with leaders um, in a consulting capacity. It's really, I, put, I didn't put them in any particular order, but I, uh, I, I did call out humility uh, at the top. I think 
in today's environment, you need to realize you can't possibly know it all. Um, you need to be authentic and real to do that. Um, I put tech savvy on there. I, I find that this younger generation and how they communicate, it's very important for a leader to, to go where they are and uh, help make that connection. I'm not just communicating, I wanna connect with people when I do that. Of course, we talked a lot about culturally intelligent. Am I uh, paying attention and am I learning um, and being curious on the things that I need to learn to be effective in today's environment? Um, the change agent and the uh, influencer, um, I put a quote out on Twitter recently and got a lot of my uh, followers um, hadn't thought about it, but I said, if, if there's no change needed where you are, if, if, there, if there's no change, then you're not needed. And so a, a leader's job is to facilitate change and to take us to the next level, to move us forward. And if there's no change, there's no need for you. So we need to figure out how to be that influencer to get people rowing with us so that, they, uh, that we're more effective and that we engage the team fully in what they do. So Linda, I'm gonna stop there and um, see if there are questions or turn it back to you. And uh, thank you very much. I've um, really enjoyed uh, getting to know you guys and uh, participating today. Thank you, Perry. Thank you, really. So everybody, while we're going to open up for questions, before we do, I have just a couple of things. First of all, I am going to put the link for the feedback form in the chat box. It's really important for us to get your feedback. Uh, so please, please do. I want to announce our next webinars, which are October 12th, The End of Relativism with Milton Bennett. November 11th, The Tolfoy Model and Diversity Competence, Cultures Don't Meet, People Do, with Arhan Verdoren. And December 12th, with Dr. Michelle Cummings Cother, How Psychological Contracts Work and how they can influence the success or failure of international assignments. So now what I ask everyone to do is to go ahead and take advantage of the chat box and send us your questions, requests, etc. I know right away, Perry, that people are very interested in the Berlitz cultural orientations model and particularly in the survey, the questionnaire, and I have people um, asking if uh, they can get your slides and how to access maybe the questions or the questionnaire. Um, we'll start with that one while I see what else comes in. Yes, yeah, so the uh, Berlitz cultural orientation model is, um, the, we call it the cultural navigator. If you search on online, you'll, you'll find it, but there's, there's, there's a number of companies that do that. So we, we do it. We're really about uh, organizational effectiveness is um, what we look to. We use that as, uh, as I shared a lot today. Uh, how do we help identify in you uh, who you are? And then we can apply that to a number of country guides that we have provide through the cultural navigator. So um, that's what I did for, and I'm going to help this company go to Canada or I'm, I personally am traveling to Japan and I'm going to Bogota, Colombia in a few weeks. And I just now, I use it as a um, matter of uh, every day um, when I'm going someplace, I want to, what do I need to know? Uh, how am I going to be more effective? What are going to be some obstacles I might have? So you take the survey, it's about 80 questions. It's a psychometrically validated uh, survey. So it's, um, we take it seriously and, the, um, the orientations then gives you a, a full report. I've got mine, uh, my um, COI, we call it, uh, Cultural Orientations Indicator. So I've got my report here. And it gives me um, quite a bit of information about where I'm going to um, have a challenge, where I might um, be strong. Even working with other people with my same uh, cultural uh, dynamic, uh, I might also learn some things about so I like that because even working with people of my own culture, um, some of my tendencies, especially strong ones, my, my fixed 
time allotment. I'm, I'm kind of a scheduled guy. I, um, I might hurt my effectiveness. So I'm always looking for ways to improve my ability to influence more. So we use the orientations model for that. Um, there's a lot of learning in there, um, country information, videos, and things like that. But it's a, it's a product we sell, and it's uh, glad to share more information about it. But, uh, and on those slides, absolutely, you can borrow the slides, have the slides, use them. Let me know if I can, uh, if you needed something else, I'm glad to share. Okay, I have a question then from Vincent, who says, I agree with you that leadership is about influencing, which is very much related to culture and personality. So what are your recommendations? Um, yeah, that's is you're on the right point is that it's uh, we all are unique individuals. We all have personalities and and you know where I come from versus where you come from and how we were raised and our backgrounds and our cultural um, the dynamics of all that. That's why it's just so important as a leader, either with a title or without a title. You're just a, an individual, but you want to influence people in your neighborhood, people in your associations, people at work, influence your boss, influence your peers, um, that I need to pay attention. If, I use the word recently, I'm, I wanna connect. How do I connect with people? I also wanna communicate, I wanna connect with you. And to me, that requires from me that I need to be more uh, appreciative of, of, of where you come, come from. I, I had a guy next to me on an airplane that said, um, we were, we were flying to central Europe. I think we were going to Prague and, uh, I asked him what he was doing and he said he was, um, going to teach some sales stuff. And I said, what have you done to prepare for the central European, um, dynamic and cultural? He goes, people are people. We're all, we all the same. We, we, we all, uh, we all want the same things. And, um, I know it's because I've gone to many countries and I realized we're not, we, we all may be trying to do the same things, but we have, we're we starting at different places. And um, I, I wish I could have flown back to the U.S. with him to see how it went, because I could just tell that he hadn't thought one bit about personalities and differences and um, the culture and how he could go back to that core and flex. Where would he need to flex in order to invite other people into the conversation? I, I find in a lot of my work that um, people are very polite and where there's a difference, they will actually, um, downplay their difference so that to keep the peace, to keep collaboration going, then they, they will, that means they're not being authentic. They, they can't be themselves because, um, I'm overrunning them or something. I, I think we had a, a person, my personal take is I need to be more open, ask more questions, invite people into the conversation especially based on my style. You, you saw my evaluation. I'm, I'm, I'm strong. You can't see me. I'm big and I have a lot of deep voice and I, I can intimidate. I don't want to, I don't mean to, but I have to be aware of who I am and how I affect people. And if I really want to connect, increase influence and increase engagement, I need to be the one to draw them in. And that requires me to be educated about cultural norms and differences and how I can bridge that gap. Even if I need to flex, um, they may need to flex too, but that's not my responsibility. My responsibility is me. So, Vincent, thank you for the question. I'm not sure I answered it, but really appreciate the way you're thinking on that. Okay, and we have someone who would like to know. It's, um, sorry, Natalia, who says thank you very much. And she would like to know if you see difference between challenges which multicultural leaders on top and middle organizational level space? And how are their challenges different? Uh, you know, the, the, the higher you go with the middle management, higher management, I, there are more eyes on you. And um, I'll tell you, I, if I had you in the audience, I would make you repeat after me. My people are watching me all the time. All the time, my people are watching me. And so what I'm finding is most organizations go the way of the, of the most visible leaders. They, they said, I just had a coaching call yesterday with a, with a CEO and I asked him, what did he think established the organizational culture? What did it feel like to work for his company? What was it that set that up? And he finally came to the realization. He said, me, how I act, 
react, how I lead, how I speak, how I communicate, my values as I live them and show them. I can say one thing, but people don't, they don't do what you say, they do what you do. And so what I'm thinking is uh, the difference between the, the challenges um, are about the same. If you don't take it seriously, that people are, people have different come froms and backgrounds and it's up to us. I love that curiosity. It's one, I'm, uh, I'll be honest with you, my head is all around, how do I teach leaders? Can you teach curiosity? Uh, my, my immediate, no, <laughs> but, but you, I can be more aware that I need to be curious. And that to me means asking questions, doing homework, investing in knowing more about you. And most of my senior guys and girls that I uh, have, the, have the privilege of coaching um, don't take that time sometimes that they need to, to invest in them to learn these differences. And so I think the higher you go, the more exposed you are, the more you influence those in the organization. But the, the challenges are a lot the same, um, but it's easy to get high up and, and not be humble and think you don't need it. And I think that's really one of the personal challenges many high level leaders face is they, they think that they're above it and none of us are above it. This is, this goes across all threads of the organization. And we have a comment question here from Elizabeth that I find speaks very much to what you just said too, Terry, which is that she has couple, she has clients who feel overwhelmed by these suggestions. And their point of view is that they have a lot of other tasks, not much time, not much mind power for the change. Motivate your clients in such situations. Yes. Um, uh, if I had a dime for every person that told me, I know I should do that. I just don't have time, um, including my children. I would be a rich man because uh, it seems to be our, our go-to excuse that I don't have time. So at my house, my children are no longer allowed to say that. You're only allowed to say, I didn't take the time because I've done a global survey in my 47 countries that I've been blessed to speak in. Um, everybody has 24 hours in a day. Not one country that I've been to has more than 24 hours. So the question is, what did you do with your 24? And they all, they start smiling at me about that time. And I said, it's all, it's all about um, what I've come to learn in my years is that people do what they want to do. If you want to do it, you'll make the time. If you don't, you'll make an excuse. And I just, I go back to the motivation. Well, how motivated are you to increase your reputation, drive influence and increase engagement? And if you're motivated to do that and you, you say, well, what would I need to do to do that? I would coach you. You need to know your people. Uh, you need to invest in your people and you need to connect with your people. And that's going to require some education. I'll tell you, I didn't put it in today's, but uh, every follower is asking three questions about you. Um, this is at your home. This is in your community. And this is at your work. Everybody that's around you asking three questions. Um, can you help me? Do you care about me? And can I trust you? Can you help me? Do you care about me? Can I trust you? If the answers to those three questions are yes, you are well on your way to, to making a high engagement, high influence leadership journey. If any of those are not there, then you need to figure out how do I, how do I help my team? How do I care? And a lot of that care dynamic is going to come in learning more about them so that you can connect on a different level than you are today. And then we have someone who has asked about situational leadership saying that the discourse on leadership styles is replaced by a focus on situations and of course context. So what about the level of motivation of team members? How can a global lead leader motivate people mm. keeping their cultural roots in mind? Very nice question. Yes. Um, I always, I'm often asked, can you, um, can you come in and do a motivational talk? Can you motivate my team? And I kind of, I'm a funny guy, so I just always say, well, why don't you just hire motivated people? Um, but then you find out that there's so many dynamics in the workplace today, so many things going on. And as I said, those, that perfect storm of uh, things are moving fast and um, directions and it's just a lot going on. How, how do I um, you know, situationally um, lead my team? One, you know, this 
what I've really learned about the cross-cultural piece is um, what motivates me doesn't motivate everybody. That matter of fact, probably motivates very few people. Um, based on a lot of those, you've got that chart with the levels of culture, based on your national or ethnic, even your gender, maybe your religious, maybe your organizational cultures, all these things come together to say what drives me and th that level of motivation. What I'm finding, the research uh, bears this out, is that motivation is really about a couple things that, um, am I relevant? Do I feel relevant to what's going on? Do, uh, do you need me to do that? Um, am I, uh, are you helping me improve, uh, develop mastery in me? So are you helping me develop? And are we working on something that's bigger than me? Uh, it, it, this, does this matter? Does this work matter? Uh, I were a leader and I am today with my team. I, I look at, we, we think at Berlitz, we say, why do we do what we do? We sell language, we sell culture training. Um, why? We want to make the world a better place. That's bigger than Perry. That's bigger than my team. We, we want to help people come together around the world. Uh, mastery is about helping. Can I invest in the people, develop, help them develop their skills? I go back to help, care, and trust. I can help you get better. I show that I care about you by investing in your education and your learning. And then letting you know that you're relevant. I can't do this without you. Those are the three strong motivators for most people. It's not money's nice and awards and, and uh, recognition are great, but you can't keep doing those. That those that you should do those every chance you get, but you can't do them all the time. So what can I do all the time? Invest in you, reassure your relevance, and make sure you know our why. What are we doing and why are we doing it? And a lot of that, the, the cultural backgrounds of people, those are on different levels. You got to be very aware of what's going on so that what I'm giving to an American associate is not something I might give to a European associate um, because those motivations might be different based on some of those systems we talked about that come from our background. So that's probably a big topic. Probably do a whole talk on that one question there because that's, that's a good one. Okay, Perry, I'm going to ask you just really rapidly because someone asked it and I don't know, you've kind of repeated the, the idea several times. Can you repeat the three questions that three team questions. members ask of their leader? How can yes. you help me? Go ahead. What was Three questions? Well, it was to hear the three questions from team members, right, to their leader. Do you care how can about you help me? me? Yeah. How can you help? Do you, can you help me? Yes. Do you do you care about me? And can I trust you? Okay. By the way, if trust isn't there, the other two don't matter. But um, most, I always always ask in a facilitating situation, what do you do to help? And we always say, yeah, yeah, I help. No, actually, write it down. What do you do to help the people on your team? What do you do to show care? And by the way, little tip. Everybody receives care differently. Just because it shows care to you, you might be you know, telling them how great they are because you love it when people tell you how great you are. But they think, why don't you quit telling me how great I am and just let me do my job. They're not motivated by that. Find out what, what, people, what shows care to them and do that. And then trust. What are the things that build trust? What are the things we inadvertently do that could hurt trust? You know, not following through, not doing what I said I would do, some things like that. So you can actually think through those three questions and analyze yourself on that. It's a fantastic exercise. Okay, I think we're going to close there. There was a comment saying that um, the success of a team needs both team success and individual success. Mm, yeah, great. And we have someone talking about uh, American culture, lowest context of all, uh, and it is the most useful for international teamwork. I'm already having trouble reading this. As a result, we tend to miss a lot of nonverbal or subtle spoken communication. How can we respectfully get people from other cultures to drop to our level when working in an international team? Yeah, that's an entire workshop there. That, that's a really, really a good observation, though. And I, I know my own, uh, I'm a high context. On my survey says I'm very high context, which is helpful in my international travel. Um, but we have a low context um, culture uh, here. So um, we, we, could, we could probably dive into that is that, that whole flex and core thing. Who, who needs to style shift 
me, the American, going to your culture or you coming to my culture? Uh, I think it's a little bit of both. Um, but often just working with the team and letting them know if we have that help, care, and trust idea, we can share these things with each other. I love, I, I have a, um, a woman from India working on my team, and she and I have developed this. I just ask her, I say, tell me how that came across to you. What did I just, did, should I have, and we, we have this whole dialogue now, and I love having that open dialogue. It just helps us all get smarter, that I want to help you, you want to help me. We want to be effective together. We want to uh, drive great results. Um, we're not going to do it alone. If I can't do it alone, we need the team. So there's a lot of back and forth dynamics and it's all, we're all learning. Trust me, I've stepped in it many times in many cultures and al uh, almost 100% of the time, people were very forgiving and uh, we, had a, we had a smile about it later. So uh, it's, a great, it's a great world we live in. I hope that uh, you get to enjoy all of it. Okay, so I want to thank you really, really, Perry, for this uh, interesting uh, and inspiring webinar. Well, I'm you. going to say goodbye. I'm going to remind people to send us their feedback. Now, for those of you, what I would like to ex suggest because of the new laws on protection of personal data, we have Perry's, or you have Perry's, personal website and Twitter on the screen. Can I ask them, Perry, to simply write to you if they would like a copy of your slides? Certainly, I, I can post those in a uh, in the cloud someplace and give you a link. Um, glad to, glad to do that. Anybody would like that? I'm glad to share anything I have. Okay, and so everybody, Perry, and all of you who participated, thank you very much, and hope to meet you soon. Be my pleasure. I see Riesling Country. I'm I'm in, I'm enticed. I think. Thank you.